Thank you for doing this. We're all very excited in the office about the new coffee. Of course, we haven't been okay. able to taste it yet, mm -hmm. but we're sure it will be fantastic. Yes, I'm excited yeah. to be working with you guys as well. Perfect. Why don't you tell me a bit about yourself and how you got into uh, the industry in the first place? Mm -hmm. So I was, I was born in Guatemala um, from a German family um, that immigrated here uh, in the 1880s. 1880s? Yes. Um, I was going to first... say because you have a very German name. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Uh, we'll continue okay. doing it in, 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 But... in English and then. Um, so basically, I, I, I grew up in a coffee farm. Um, my family had been in coffee for five generations. I'm the fifth generation. Um, they initially came with the Hamburg Coffee Company to run an estate here in Guatemala. And then many generations later, um, I spent a lot of time at the coffee farm. And I did one of my first job and in internships at Starbucks purchasing in Switzerland. Uh, this was uh 14 years ago but of course like i i didn't want to do what my parents did so Who does? i was like no 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 more coffee um and i lived in london and worked at a hedge fund um and i worked there for a little while and we were doing a commodities fund and it was very clear to me that people that were buying and selling coffee contracts had no idea what was behind it and that there were people and families and and this I mean, millions and millions of families behind this commodity that people were just buying and selling in the market that they had no clue about. Um, so after that, I decided to, to leave the industry. I worked for another importer in the UK for a little bit. And, and that's when I realized I, I love specialty coffee. I, I want to focus on smaller producers Um, and, of, and of course, uh, focus on quality. So the initial step was to open an importer in the UK to start bringing in coffee from Guatemala, including my family's farm, neighbors, anyone that was interested in finding a, an alternative market. Um, and then <laughs> kind of fast forward now, it's been uh, next year is our 10th year. Um, oh. Yeah, doing this, it's been it's flown by really. Um, and we grew from, you know, working with a few producers that were our neighbors to now working with over 300 small producers in the Wawatenango region. We, we shifted our, our focus from, from like the bigger farms that we were working with to more small producers, cooperatives, um, really focusing on quality and on getting these, these coffees access to market that they didn't have any access before. Um, or they were blended. Of course, they, they had access to market, but to a commodities market where everything was blended and you know no one knew what the, what the coffee really tasted like. Um, and since then, four, five years ago, I moved back to Guatemala uh, to be closer to production, to be closer to sourcing. And we also opened our exporting company. So when you're working with us, you work directly as directly as possible. So we see ourselves as a direct trade facilitator because we have, you know, you can buy 10 bags and you can know exactly where it's coming from. And eventually if you, if, if someone is big enough, they can buy a full container directly from us in Guatemala, it doesn't have to be through the importer. Um, and we have also opened a, a similar uh, company in the US where we sell coffee to small and medium-sized coffee roasters in the U.S. Uh, and now we've expanded to sell in in Australia, Japan, uh, the Middle East, Hong Kong. It's just been like um, a wave of, of interest in our in our work. Um, and it, it's, it's nice to see because we haven't been very good at marketing it. We've been very good at doing it without telling people, I guess. And now it's, uh, it's kind of a last year that I had a bit more time to, to think about things and the strategy for the business, we're really pushing towards having more transparency, a better pricing structures, making sure that, you know, everything goes back to the producer and, and we're as efficient as possible. Um, we opened our own dry mill last year, or sorry, earlier this year, so in February, and uh, we run it as tightly as possible. 
Um, what else? <laughs> we, uh, the idea behind Primavera is to have also a support network year round. We do not just go and buy the coffee and leave. Uh, we have a team of four agronomers in Huehuetenango that visit our producers on a regular, regular basis to ensure that you know they're pruning correctly, they're fertilizing, and throughout the year they're doing the necessary work so that they can uh, have continuous improvement in their quality and consistency because we've seen that that is as one of the bigger issues with this. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you essentially grew up on a farm. Now, there is, of course, a very clear distinction, maybe not so clear to, to some people, but between a farm where you grow coffee and harvest coffee and an importer. So you are now, you decided to set up your uh, importing business, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound as elegant as it is but that's because of my <laughs> English. Um, but when you grew up on a farm, did you, you, I mean, you must have gotten a pretty good impression of how, uh, especially harvesters and coffee farmers work, the conditions they work mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Was that something that uh, inspired you to uh, you know, found your own importing business? Certainly, I mean, a it was always amazing that each cup of coffee had so much labor and specific work behind that, that a lot of people didn't understand. That's why, it, that's why I left the hedge fund because I was like, you have no idea what is behind a cup of coffee. And, and I, I used to get so mad at people. I'm like, you no, know, like you have no idea what's behind and the, the work that goes on in order to have this this amazing beverage um so yes i definitely think that that had a big influence in 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 the way we've sort of run things and um yeah the importer is not as as glamorous as it sounds but at the same time you know it is it is an access the, the idea was to be completely vertically integrated so have our own, we have our own trucks, our own exporting company, importer, and uh, to have that full traceability uh, for, for the customers. And the idea is that we pay for quality because that was one of the main things that I could, that could tangibly be tasted and you can request more money for a coffee if it tastes well. Um, hopefully one day, all of the coffee will be valued better in a better way and all of the work all the manual labor you know even bigger lots that are probably not as high scoring coffees will also you know be valued better uh, at a higher price because really everything that goes into the coffee is is there's so much work sure. yeah see there are two questions already the first one is how do you decide as an importer which producers to work with Question number two, have you been able to see and how have you been able to see and measure how the working conditions and the general lives of the producers that you work with have improved mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. they work with you? Yeah. So the first question is, how do we, so the, initially we started asking for samples for the, for the, our neighbors and saying, you know, we're, we're buying coffee and at a your family. premium. Yes, but I no longer work with them. <laughs> uh, I think uh, we focus on, on, on smaller producers that need access to market. There's, my family have been selling coffee for many, many, many years to Italian roasters, and I think they're good on that. So uh, it was definitely like a learning ground for me, but they're, they're set. So, um, so first we, we request a sample, and we cup the sample, and if it's of... Uh, a good quality, we visit the producer and we make sure that they have certain standards in their farm. Um, if they're part of a cooperative, they will tend to have this. If not, we we have a set of rules to become a member. We call it a member of our, of our the exporting company is called La Central de Café. So to become a member of La Central de Café, um, they have to meet certain requirements, everything to do with environmental, social, and, um, sustainability and then we we take care of the economic sustainability um in paying higher prices for the premium coffee um so that's that's sort of the first step into 
getting to know more producers. The really nice thing that we've seen is that producers that work with us have continued to work with us throughout the years. Um, and they tell their neighbor like, oh, I, I sold this coffee to, to this importer and this exporter. And, and then all of a sudden we get so many samples during the harvest. Um, and But we do make sure to visit every single producer to look at their farm, to have pictures, to have the traceability behind them. Um, that's one thing. And then um, your next question is, um, sorry. So the, if you've been able to, to see the improvement to see, over yes. the lives of so, the producers. Yeah, so this is, this is a question that I've been thinking about, about a lot and it's, I think it's a, it's a difficult one because obviously here you're paying producers more but you cannot tell them what to do with that money. So initially we were like, no, 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 they have to build a new patio or a new uh, dry wet mill tank or this or that. And we were really pushing people to do these certain things. And then we realized, you know, maybe a family, what they really need and what is going to change their lives is a new, uh, uh, an extra bathroom in their house or school for their children. Or, and I cannot tell them what to do with their money. So in that sense, uh, we've kind of stepped back a little bit in, in terms of asking them to improve their coffee quality with the, the extra pricing that we give them um, and sort of asked more like, what do you need? And we've had some, some interesting answers like that. Um, and we do, last year, uh, we did a sustainability report where you see the prices and the premiums that we paid above um, the C market and, and fair trade um, and the local coffee prices. So that's the way we kind of been measuring the, the success or, or, or the extra resources that producers get. Um, however, we don't have a specific like, oh, they, everyone now has a new wet tank or something like that. Um, we also have some other projects that we work with. Like last year, we did a, a fundraising for, for COVID, like emergency funds. Um, this year, we're doing a community garden center so that people can come and, and look at how to, to grow vegetables and do it back at home. And we have seeds, we have all, all of the equipment. Um, and so a few different projects, we, we donated um, like water filtration tanks so that everyone has access to clean drinkable water and things like that, that are, uh, that we've, we've done throughout the years, but we've never like actively marketed or, or told anyone. It's just nature. Like we, I've been to see all these producers so many times and they produce amazing coffee and we want to help them in whatever way is possible. Mm -hmm. Um, what in terms of the the actual payment uh, for the people who the harvesters, uh -huh. I think they're called, um, because I presume you don't have a minimum wage in Guatemala. We do. We do oh. have a minimum wage. We do have a minimum wage, and it has to be respected. Um, mm. All the uh, the pickers uh, they get paid on a on a daily basis, and it depends on the coffee price and where you are located. Um, so there tends to be a lot of uh, migration during the harvest season uh, to the areas that are more difficult to, to grow coffee in, have higher prices for picking. And you earlier mentioned that you now have a, uh, your own dry mill. Yeah. For you as an importer, what's the benefit or the advantage of having your own dry mill? Well, because we have so many micro lots, I think it was becoming, <sighs> So we've always had our own dry mill. We were processing at the farm's dry mill. Um, and that worked well. And because we have so many micro lots, uh, you know, we have to be very careful in terms of milling, like making sure the only this lot gets milled and not another one. And, um, but we decided that it was time to invest in a, in a better facility with all brand new machines, brand new electronic machine in order to process the coffees better. Um, so the idea behind having this is, is to make sure the quality is higher and the lots are sorted perfectly. Um, the, I don't think many people realize the importance of a dry mill. Um, and, you know, milling 10 bags is very different than milling a whole container. Um, you have to stop the machines, clean everything, and then restart for the next micro lot. So, um, 
so yeah, it, that has been, I think, it was definitely a learning challenge this year because it's all new machinery. You have to get used to it. You have to learn how it works. But but I think uh, the guys at the mill did a great job, and and hopefully next year will be will be better. It also makes us, you know, more competitive in terms of pricing, uh, in terms of uh, how quickly we can turn around containers and coffees and all of that because it's it's a very short season uh, mm. where you mill and export. But considering that you are expanding, as you mentioned earlier, you must be very successful. Uh, <laughs> well, I think... Uh, we, it's not a question, it's just a rhetorical yeah. one. Yeah, I think it's been, to be honest, it's been an amazing journey for us because um, we, you know, I started out handing samples to people, um, to coffee roasters, being like, you know, try our coffee, it's, it's great. Uh, to now, you know, getting requests from all over the world, as I, as I mentioned, from uh, we have now co uh, customers in Asia and all through the Middle East, Australia, like it's been overwhelmingly positive for us in that sense. Um, and we definitely sort of started at the perfect timing when co with specialty coffee was kind of on the rise and we definitely rode that wave uh, with it. And I think I've been a very lucky position where I understand what the roasters want in terms of quality, cup profiles. Obviously everyone wants something different, but I, I get the picture and I, and I understand what they're looking for. And at the same time, I understand what the producer wants. And, and it's like understanding and knowing both worlds has been, I think, very important for us and a key to our, our success really is, is that. Do you think there is, and what makes Guatemala coffee? Is there a specific quality that coffee from Guatemala has? Definitely, I think, um, so we're a very, very small country, but at the same time, our topography is incredibly diverse. Uh, we have over 300 microclimates, we have different regions, different soils. The weather in each region is very different. Um, like, for example, in Huehuetenango, which is on the northern western side of the country, close to Mexico, we get a lot of hot air. But at the same time, the location is very cold and very high. So that's one particular you know, aspect that gives the, the coffees its qualities. And then you have other regions, for example, Colan, it always rains there, like it's always misty. And that gives the coffee a different quality. Uh, we've got a lot of volcanic soils that gives it a different flavor. So I think it's a country that has coffee for everyone. Like if you want something more, more drinkable and orange and chocolate, you have that. And if you have some, if you want some wild, you know, berries and all of that we have that as well and if you want something more floral there's also that so um i think it's a country that has coffee for everyone and the history of coffee in guatemala has been very long very very long they've been growing coffee for for a very long time and that has been both advantageous and 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 not because people have stuck to their ways but slowly there a lot of people are experimenting and, and being interested in doing honeys and naturals and experimenting with processing and things like that so it's it's definitely been a it's it's a wonderful country to work with in, in terms of coffee i read somewhere and i can't remember where it was might have been in a book recently that guatemala coffee is comparatively sweet and I always get suspicious when I read things like that because they're always generalizations. Mm -hmm. um, but would you say that's a fair assessment? I also don't like generalizations. <laughs> um, comparably sweet to other countries? To, to... to, let's say, Ethiopia, for example. I mean, there's sweet coffees in Ethiopia as well. I mean, there's... It's very difficult to 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 say something like that. I wouldn't I wouldn't say something like that. But definitely, there's a lot of coffees that are very sweet. It's certainly one of the characteristics we look for in coffee. Um, I do think it has to do with the manual picking. 
So every because everything is picked manually, uh, you have selective picking. So it will be ripe cherries that will be picked, and that has a direct correlation to the coffees being sweeter. I don't know if if maybe compared to countries that pick with machines such as Brazil or, or somewhere else, um, maybe you could see a, a difference in sweetness in that sense. But I don't mm. think we're sweeter than I love African coffees. <laughs> so do I. Who doesn't? Uh huh. Uh, but since you mentioned the picking, I don't know how much time you have, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, we get to, we will get two coffees from you. The one mm -hmm. is the one I still struggle with pronunciation, the El Aguacate. Uh -huh, which means the avocado. Oh, let, I will just say the avocado then. Uh -huh. And the San Antonio Huista. Yes. Now, I did my research on your homepage. Mm -hmm. And it says that the avocado is a ripe cherries harvest. Mm -hmm. The San Antonio is a selective picking of ripe cherries. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? I think it, it was just wording. We have different people that translate in English the info sheets. So I think that's, that's the main reason. There's no difference. The idea is that you, you go through the farm twice or three times per harvest and only pick the cherries that are ripe. Yeah. So it's selective picking and it's selective mature picking. Uh, but there's no difference. It's just wording. Okay, good. Because I was confused for a second. But <laughs> since you talked about the samples you get from producers, is there something particular that you are looking for in a coffee that you want to take on board, a producer mm -hmm. you want to represent, something that mm -hmm. is especially important to you, not when it comes to the conditions of the harvest, for example, but to the taste and flavors of a coffee. Yes. So what? So we have a few Q graders on the team, including myself. And what I particularly look for is cleanness, sweetness and juiciness that's my favorite those are like my three things that i look for and then of course like if it if it goes above and beyond that we we love it um so this year we actually have a new series called the arco series and it's where we have all the coffees that are like above and beyond any any of our expectations then we have the micro lots and then we also buy coffees that are you know really good sweet a uh, super balanced and everything and we have a blend called the primavera family blend um where we include a lot of the coffees from from the producers that also have coffees in the arcoiris uh which is the very top series of our of our coffees um but they might have two or three different parcelas so in these regions they're not really farms because they're not big enough to be considered a farm uh so they're less than a hectare a, in size and for example one producer might have one that's very high in the mountains and that'll be an Ancoides lot and then they'll have something lower that might be going into our family blend so the idea is to work with the producer in 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 all of its coffee not just like oh we are only going to take your top 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 coffee we want to we want to ensure that the producer is is well supported all around Of course, we're not going to buy anything that doesn't meet our standard. Um, but for example, this this family blend has been very popular because it's kind of like a big farm because all of the producers are next to each other or in a very small area. So um, that's sort of what we've done in that sense because initially we were only buying the higher lots because we didn't have a market for these other coffees. And now we found that, no, we actually, we do and it's great and it's it's a different price. Uh, because obviously it's more of a, a blender coffee, but it's it's worked really well. And when you're negotiating with a company like Coffee Circle, for example, then of course we, in this case, will receive some samples for cupping and we decide mm -hmm. what kind of coffees we want to have. From your mm -hmm. side, your perspective on this process, how does that work? How do you decide what kind of samples to send? What do you offer? What's that part of the process like? So this is, is, has changed throughout the years. Um, at the beginning, it was more like trying to send as many samples as possible to each customer. And now we've uh, 
gotten to know our customers very well to see oh this coffee would really like like would really suit this customer and this coffee and normally uh we have a lot of roasters that have been working with the same producer for five six years so we already know like this, this customer is getting these 10 samples from the, the 10 producers that he always tastes um or that they always taste so that's the way that we've we've done it in the past a um, when we get a new customer, we try to see what they're looking for. We go on their website, see the cupping notes that they have and see what they're looking for really. And then send samples from there. Okay. So you would send, I mean, for a new customer like us, you would send 10 samples, for example? Yeah, roughly eight, eight is, is, is what we found um, that is a good amount. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And you said you now represent about 300 producers or, or farms. Mm -hmm. So that does that mean that you have 300 different kinds of coffees waiting to be sold or exported? Yes. So this year we actually, I have the exact number because I do all of that logistics. And we had 285 micro lots. Um, some are big lots, some are full containers, um, and some are five bags, 10 bags, but we have 285 of them. That's, that's a lot though, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you uh, eventually you have to sell all of that. Yes. Uh, we try to, the, the, it's also split, like we do, around half of our coffees we sell FOB, so directly from Guatemala, and the rest we do uh, from Europe or the US. And yeah, it, it's a lot of coffee. It's, it's a lot of coffee to remember. We, we also here in the lab in Guatemala, we cup the coffees once a month. So we cup 285 coffees every month to see how they're aging, to have any uh, feedback to our producers because a lot of coffees open up later in the year you know cupping during the harvest is is difficult because they're so fresh so so fresh and so cupping the coffees throughout the months allows us to see you know all the coffees end up being better in august or in september which tends to be the case um and if for example if we see a coffee that's aging this year we had one two lots, which is pretty amazing for 285. Um, I think it's been one of the best years quality wise. Um, for that, for example, we, we start either discounting it or taking it off our, our offer lists and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of coffees, but we receive over a thousand samples when we are, offer, when we are offered coffee. So uh, during the harvest, we spend a lot of time cupping. Yeah, I imagine so. Uh, to briefly wrap this up, because your dog is barking. Uh, I read in a book about uh, Guatemalan coffee that, and this is pretty much a direct quote, but I read it in German, is that it's no coincidence that the public school holidays in Guatemala coincide with the harvest season. Because allegedly, according to this book, uh, children are often used just to help with the harvest. Now, I presume not in the, in the case of the farms that you represent, but more generally when it comes to the history of coffee growing in Guatemala. Yeah, I mean, I think that that might have been an accurate representation of many years ago. Um, school holidays have slightly changed and also the, the picking season has changed. Uh, I'll, I'll explain why, which is, I think this is fascinating, but maybe 50 years ago, Anacafe, which is a national coffee organization, started to have a policy where they wanted to excel in quality because they realized we're not going to be able to, to compete Vietnam and Brazil, like impossible. We're a tiny country full of mountains, like either we fight with quality or we don't, or we lose. So they started having this policy where coffee had to be grown at a higher level. So any farms that were below 900 meters, 800 meters, were encouraged to farm something else. So for example, we have a farm that's at 900 meters, 
and we were encouraged to get to get rid of coffee. We still have the wet mill and everything there. Really? Are you now, still after after all these years? Is that still? Well, it's, an I mean, it, it, well, it's a it's a it's a ruin. Like it hasn't been used in twenty five thirty years. Um, but we now my father now grows rubber in that farm. Um, and I think the national, it was in the national interest to have Guatemalan coffees be of higher quality and for everyone to think, oh, Guatemalan coffees is, is of a higher quality. Therefore, the price difference or the differential on top of the steam price is, tends to be one of the highest in Central America. Uh, so the holiday season for schools was more in line with these farms that were at lower altitudes because the holiday season is November and December. But now mm. picking is January, February, and March. Like because we, they we are at a receive, higher, higher altitude. Uh -huh. oh. We don't receive samples until mid-January, February. So, so maybe, maybe back 50 years ago, the idea was to have not kids picking coffee but certainly during the holidays you know you need to either pay someone to watch your kids or what do you do so uh, families used to go together to the field um in order to the, the parents would pick coffee and the kids would be playing around the this is what i imagine i i'm not sure i wasn't <laughs> i wasn't around 50 years ago but i think that was the main reason why why this um comparison is made or why this why this is brought up in, in books hmm. and it's still the case that in order to remain competitive you most of your farms are at a specific higher altitude than they were you know some decades ago yeah there's a lot of farms that were that were huge farms because obviously at a lower altitude you tend to have more planes sure um so there are big big farms that now grow something else everything from palm oil to rubber to cacao to whatever um that used to grow coffee and i think i mean for 50 years ago that was a very very interesting and forward-looking strategy to have um and to really push forward the quality as a country in general yeah i mean it's so interesting i had no idea And you would think that when you are at a lower altitude, as you said, you have more space to grow coffee. Therefore, you would be, you know, let's say, as productive, if not more productive or competitive sure. than if you grow at a high altitude and have yes. less space. Yes, but not as competitive as Brazil in terms of like volume and, and prices. Huh. So, yeah, to me, that's one of the most interesting things that, that this organization has done. Obviously, you were not, you were not uh, obligated to change your crop, but you were very, very um, uh, encouraged to do so. Were there some, I, mean, I presume there are always farmers who say, no, I'm going to do what I've always done. I'm not going to yeah, change and then the market, and then the market came and they were out. So... <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, especially in, in tough years, big farms are a heavier problem than small farms, obviously. Um, so in, in years where the prices are very low, managing and keeping a, a big farm is expensive and you go, can go bankrupt very quickly. Um, whereas with small producers, they're, they're either going to have smaller, smaller labor needs or they will pick themselves and their families. Um, so they tend to survive price prices is a lot better than big farms. Which is also interesting because in most other industries, it's the opposite. Yeah, I know economies of scale, but no, no, with picking because you need a lot of pickers and you need a lot of farm workers and you need, you know, and fertilizer and this and that. And you, you know, with smaller farms, people tend to get away with maybe not pruning one year or not fertilizing one year, but with a big farm, hmm. <laughs> So it, it, I was I was going to ask how you coped with with or how you are coping with climate change. Everything that you just said had nothing to do with that. It, there was another reason for the uh -huh. higher altitude. And now it's it's been interesting because so climate obviously has been all over the place. It hasn't been warmer. It's been just crazy. 
So I think the hardest thing for, for producers is the rain patterns. Not necessarily like, oh, it's hotter, it's colder. No. It's rain patterns. So we in Guatemala have two seasons, rainy season and not rainy season. <laughs> and it's very marked, very, very marked. Like during the rainy season, it's hot during the morning. And by 2 p.m., it's pouring rain. Mm. Um, and then when it's not rainy season, it doesn't rain for months and so uh and that dictates when you can fertilize you know when you should prune because uh with higher humidity uh, you need more sunlight because of fungus and other things um and then also when you prune you leave the leaves on the floor uh in order to when it's the dry season it keeps the humidity on the on the ground so it's all it's all connected and if you don't have the rain cycle, then it messes everything up. Mm. Um, and it's been, it's definitely been challenging. You saw the, the problems with Roya or coffee leaf rust uh, in 2012, 13, which is, or was our second year. It was, it was horrible. It was horrible. And, and the wet rain pattern, patterns were all over the place and you couldn't control when you could spray and what, and, and it just spread so quickly because you have two days of rain and then a week of sun, which is perfect environment for any fungus, you know, humid and then hot, pff, everywhere. Um, and so I think that was, th those were, were challenging years. Um, and this year has been great. Last year and this year have been, <laughs> I know we're all like, we hope it can, continues this way. Uh, but but a lot of producers have been much more aware of, of this and, and they've realized, man, we really have to be strategic of when we prune, when we fertilize and all these things. So it's it's both been, of course, it's it's a negative and a challenge for everyone. But at the same time, it's been an opportunity for everyone to see, OK, now we really need to take care of our environment. Like We can't chop trees down like that keeps our, our humidity in the soil that keeps everything there. Like we can't just at the top of the mountain people were chopping the trees in order to I don't know what to build houses or, or sell the wood um, but now that a lot of the producers are like no we, we're gonna continue farming as environmentally friendly as possible mm. so, yeah Oh, <laughs> sorry crossed. that was a very long long response but I, I no that's, I love long <laughs> response it's better than just yes or no which is uh, every interview is worst nightmare. So yeah, right. very much appreciated. Yes, any anytime. And I hope that uh, you guys are able to come to Guatemala sometime. I don't know with this COVID situation, what the future has for us, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe I mean, are, does Guatemala now allow inbound flights again? Yeah, yes, because last year we were locked in. Uh, we do allow and you have to have a COVID test um, and ideally be vaccinated. And um, the situation here is quite bad. Um, it wasn't that bad last year. Like people got really scared and like went home, but now everyone's like, well, maybe this is fake or I don't know what, what they're thinking, but they're started going out more and a lot of people got infected and we were very slow in getting vaccines. And now we do have vaccines, but people are like, oh, we don't, we're not sure if we want to get vaccinated. <laughs> because of yeah. misinformation from all over the place. So yeah, same um, story everywhere, I'm afraid. Yeah. So, but hopefully, I mean, we did do a virtual origin trip last year, which has been a great success. Uh, I don't know if you saw the videos that we created. No, I'll send them to you. I'll send you the, the sustainability report and the videos because we decided, okay, if you're not able to come, we want you to visit the farms without being there, right? But we don't want to do like, a, I've seen so many Instagram farm visits that are horrible because you're just in the car and you're getting busy and you're like, why is this even, huh? why? Um, so we did nine videos that are two to three minutes long, narrated, graph like full video from the nursery to the export and it teaches you like it shows you okay this is the coffee goes from the nursery and what happens in every step of the process until it goes on the ship 
which I think is is fairly interesting. It is. Um, it sounds. Yeah, I would love to. See <laughs> I'll send it to you because it's. I think. Well, I mean, I'm biased because I <laughs> we did it, but it's uh, both informative. If you've been to a farm and you know the the every step, then you know it's sec it's repetitive. But if you haven't been, or if it's a, you've been a few times, it, it will be it will be interesting. Um, and especially for you guys to share with your colleagues, maybe the baristas that haven't been to a coffee farm might be interesting Absolutely. for them and things like that. Yeah. Cool. Great. Uh, thank you so much. You're very welcome. And, you know, if you have any other questions or anything, we're very happy to chat and be as open as possible from both sides. And I, I hope you enjoy the coffee and hope to receive feedback from you guys and and to, for this to be a, a, a long-term partnership because that's really what we're looking for so that you know we can spend our time and our resources in finding better coffees rather than like finding more and more customers and uh, if we keep our customer base happy and and good then we can add more more producers to our to our family oh absolutely it makes everybody happy uh -huh. And I will send you my articles when they're online. Since you are able to speak and understand German, it won't be a problem. No, but I have just totally forgotten. I can a bit in Dutch speak. I find the Dutch school in Guatemala. Oh, very. Right. See, that's better than most Germans. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank but... you, and speak to you soon. Bye, bye.